Hello and welcome to the Fintech Finance Virtual Internet. Today we're going to be talking about UK faster payments and the new access models, as well as how this is going to relate with real-time payments. So joining me on the session today is Teresa Commons from Bottom Line and Gavin McLean from Lloyd's. Guys, thank you so much for joining me here today. I think the best way to kick things off is uh, for our audience as well, is to really get you guys to intro yourselves and so we can find out a bit bit more about yourselves and and really your roles at your organization so uh gavin could i ask you to kick things off please yep hi doug so gavin mclean i head up the payments product and development team at lloyd's and um, that means i am immersed in payments from physical cash and checks going over branch counters right through to digital payments card payments cross-border payments uh, I am an unashamed, lifelong payments geek, so this role is a, a great fit for me. And in this role, it allows me to build new products, to innovate, to enhance the products that we already have, and to work with our clients to help them succeed in an increasingly digital world. Incredible. Thank you so much. And Teresa, thank you also for joining. Could you also give our, our audience a bit of a background to yourself, please? Sure, pleasure. Hello, I'm Teresa. Um, a bit about me and then the role. So I've, um, I've got a background that's steeped in payments. I worked for many years for a large UK bank, different to the one that Gavin represents today. Um, and I now work for a technology company. Um, I've led in the past regulated sales teams, selling money market funds and open investment companies. I've managed cash management products on both sides of the balance sheet and I've led global engagement programs, helping customers navigate the payments landscape, particularly when it comes to regulation. I'm a really strong advocate of diversity as well. I'm a member of the EMEA board for women in payments. So that's something that I'm, I'm also very passionate about alongside payments. I'm here today in my role of head of bank proposition for bottom line. Now, a quick pen picture in numbers of Bottom Line for those that don't know. Bottom Line is a global technology company, operates in 92 countries, supports 1,400 banks, and that's 15 of the top 25. 10,000 corporates, um, 64 in the top 100 of the fortune, and we process 10 million transactions on a daily basis. So it's, it's you know, you're, you're getting a sense of, of the size of it. Um, my job as head of bank proposition is to work with banks to design commercial prod propositions that will solve either bank pain points or meet customer needs. And we do that by harnessing technology and regulation. It's a really interesting and challenging role because by, by their nature, business payments are complex. They have to be, they've got to be secure, you know, and everything else. You know, believe it or not, not everybody can do it. But when it comes to propositions, of course, they need to be simple, smart, and secure. So you're always you're always trying to get that balance. Interesting. Well, thank you very much for, for joining us on the session today. Uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing both your guys' expertise on on you know the payments in general. Really, have just changed so much. So with that in mind, I think one thing that has been apparent is one of the biggest causes for the changes in the payments industry is uh, the UK faster payments model. So Teresa, if I could come to you first. What sets the UK faster payment model apart from other services around the world? I guess for that, there's this kind of there's a twofold answer. First of all, you know, we, we should establish what we mean by by what a faster payment is, and then to answer your questions, we kind of got to compare and contrast a little bit to towards the UK scheme with those in the rest of the world. So ju just we're all on the same page. Um, a faster payment is, of course, that in a matter of seconds. So from a Barclays account, I can pay Gavin at a Lloyd's account. Um, the money will be final, it will be cleared, it will be secured, and we'll both get confirmation of that payment. And loads of payments have happened in the time that it's taken me to say that sentence. You know, it, it really is, it really is that, that fast. Across the world, they're called immediate payments, real-time payments, you know, we call them faster payments. There are probably about 50 schemes now across the world as well. And whilst they all deliver that core faster payment experience, they differentiate themselves by predominantly, I'd say, by overlay services. So, for example, here in the UK, we have the fraud protection tool, mm. whereas the Swish scheme, and I love saying the word Swish scheme in Sweden, and they don't have that. 
But by contrast, again, in Australia, you can put emojis on your faster payment and Swish and UK faster payments don't have that. There's, a, there's two other differentiators as well, to my mind, to the UK scheme. Um, the first one is longevity. It's one of the older schemes and its momentum just keeps growing. Um, if you consider that in February, just gone, February this year alone, there are 237 million faster payments processed. That's a 14% increase on February of last year. And that's kind of just as we were coming into the pandemic, because we know that kind of it spiked even further then. So it's really well used. And then finally, I think the other thing that helps differentiate our scheme is that we've got a regulator that's really pushing for innovation and to open competition. And faster payments is very much one of one of their kind of their tools to do that. Interesting. Well, uh, Gavin, uh, you know, uh, from your perspective at Lloyd's, uh, I know it, it, it could be almost an issue to kind of wax lyrically too much about the UK fast payments model. But could I also get your perspective on, on why, why it sets itself apart from other services around the world? Yeah, well, I, I think Teresa's done a great job of describing some of the, the feature and functionality differences between other services around the world. But I think what really sets us apart in the eyes of consumers and businesses here in the UK is how embedded it is in the fabric of so many of our financial journeys. So whether it's paying bills or transferring money to a friend or moving money into a savings account, so many of those journeys now are facilitated by instant payments in the UK. And also, I think as we, we go forward, what's going to be really critical is how well proven a platform for innovation faster payments in the UK is. So for example, open banking payments now utilize the faster payment service, and that's going to drive the next generation of innovation and the next wave of payment journeys that we're about to see in the UK. Absolutely excellent. I, I love that that ability to that now that we have this technology, it's only going to exponentially increase the innovations that we're going to see. Um, now, with that in mind, then that does make it sound like it's pretty imperative to to get on board with that. So, Teresa, how critical is it, especially after all these years, to to be able to have access to this service? It's it's pretty crit critical from a, a number of perspectives. Um, as Gavin says, it's intrinsic in the UK, at least to, to everyday life. So, you know, you want to be part of that, don't you? So first, it's a key enabler in its own right, but also it's the overlay services. But you know, when I think about payment service providers, there's kind of there's, there's three big themes that sort of jump out at me. First of all, there's your customer expectations. It's critical to be instant. We, we expect things very, very, very quickly. And if you go onto a website and it takes more than five seconds to load, we're frustrated and we're likely to log out or give up. Or on a shopping experience, you know, if it's asking me for too many clicks to sort of clear my basket, I'll probably abandon the basket. So you want to be modern and, you know, and to be there and to be instant. Also for providers, it's, a, it's really neat for liquidity and managing a bank's a balance sheet. You can see in real time quite how much money you've got. You know that they're final, that they cleared funds. And in some instances, that helps you avoid short-term financing needs. So, you know, so there's a cost type play there as well. Of course, Gavin's nicely touched upon the innovation it gives you as well. So there's kind of, it's embedded, but, but also, you know, there's more to come. There's things like request to pay, for example, in addition to the fraud tools like confirmation of payee. You also asked about access to the service and you know for smaller providers it can be it's, it's critical to have it but access can be challenging you've got decisions to make there and bottom line help people whether they go by a direct or an indirect access route and you need you need to be cognizant of of what's needed to go via each route so it is critical um, and has lots of advantages and benefits but there are different ways to go about it and to get access yeah i think that that's it, it's gone to that point where there is that multi-model way of getting involved, but it's still quite difficult. So uh, Gavin, can I ask, why do you think the payments industry has set such high barriers to entry for, for a lot of uh, institutions? Well, for consumers and businesses, actually, access has been very straightforward and, and widespread for, for some time. 
I mean, if you log into most banking apps or portals, um, there's usually been an option there to make a faster payment, and that's probably been there for a good few years now. So availability and choice for the consumers and businesses who make most of the faster payments in the UK um, has largely always been there. However, as Teresa says, for those wanting to offer the service, and that's mainly banks and other payment service providers, what, one of the biggest considerations has been technology. You know, when Faster Payments launched, the service had a significant technology component to it. And by the way, this was right. You know, Faster Payments was going to be, even then, processing millions of payments a day and an important part of the, the UK economic infrastructure. So technology was important and it was certainly a big consideration for, for anyone uh, thinking of connecting to, to Faster Payments. In recent years, actually, alternative access models have emerged. Um, technical access providers now solve much of the puzzle for payment service providers connecting to the service. And this has encouraged many more banks and, and PSPs to, to do so. And in fact, Lloyds have partnered with one of these providers to develop our own platform in this regard. So even, even institutions like us that were there at the start are reimagining and um, redesigning the way that we interact with the service. So I think that ecosystem of payment service providers, banks, technology providers, that continues to evolve and that is simpl simplifying access to the service all the time. I love hearing that how the ecosystem can actually after well if we were to consider payments as being quite a slow moving industry maybe 20 years before and suddenly now we're just constantly having innovations naturally evolving and even players that were once had a significant role in a specific way are now finding that change now Teresa if I could come to you as well um, why do you think and Gavin touched on it slightly at the beginning of his answer you why do you think businesses have been slow to adopt a real time payments. I suppose for, for businesses, and by, by that um, I'm, I'm talking about corporates um, in particular, um, their business models and their operations are built on older products. So you know, it's not just a question of introducing a new payment type or a new, new, you know, a, a new, new thing to their business. You're changing their business and operational models. You're moving things from say, you know, nine to five customer support to 24 seven. You know, Twitter might not be your friend. If something goes wrong and it's all real time, you, know, you don't want the, as a company, you don't, the first thing you hear about it is kind of this, this, this tsunami of complaints and negative feedback on Twitter. So it's, it's not just like that. And again, there are other there are other integrations and sort of connectivity to consider, such as with your TMS system, for example. Can your TMS systems cope with real time information and 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 um, so with real time information and those kind of those feeds in? Um, what would be really neat is if you get some APIs that will bring re real time information into your TMS and then you've got that that view and you can make decisions really quickly and you can make financing dis decisions. And if on TMS you're you're running your business via regional hubs by switching funds from one to the other in real time, that could be quite neat. But it comes at a cost of operational type type considerations and changing the way you work. So it's just not that easy. I do think, though, that uptake and the acceleration will increase with a couple of things. For corporates in particular, if you're able to embed an invoice into a payment message, sort of, you, know, you, you owe me you know, f five quid for whatever it is, here's the invoice, and by the way, here's a couple of options of the way you pay, including faster payments. I think that will accelerate adoption. It will also help the corporate reconciliation as well, because you'll know exactly what payment is attached to which invoice happy days. So I think that's that's a real, real strong buying signal. Also, the ability for corporates to take payments by QR code, that's, you know, backed by a faster payment. I think that will accelerate the drive as well. And I know we're going to go and talk about this, but also the data carried by ISO, I think will also, you know, make corporate treasurers in particular stop and think, actually, yeah, this might be the time actually to go through a little bit of sort of rejigging and restructuring in order to reap these benefits. 
Interesting. And Gavin, can I also, um, I, I think later on in the, the discussion, we will be bringing some of the, the added benefits that come about from real-time payments beyond uh, just the faster payment. But can I can I also ask for your, your in, input on top of what Teresa has just said as to why maybe corporates especially might have found the, the adoption to be slower than maybe even small, medium businesses? Yeah, I mean, real-time payments offer a range of benefits to businesses and not every benefit will be applicable to every business. So, you know, improved client experience, um, cash and working capital efficiencies, or differentiating their proposition from the competition by being the first or one of the few to, to, to offer things in real time, for example. So businesses will realise those benefits at different speeds depending on their own circumstances and I actually think we've seen a fairly standard adoption curve from the early adopters the growth and then on to more widespread adoption what's really interesting for me in, in my role at Lloyd's is that actually environmental factors right now are driving more interest in real-time payments than at any other time I can remember you know an increasingly digital economy, but also the move to digital being accelerated by the pandemic that we've been living through for the past the past year or so. So businesses are now looking to embed real-time payments in many more of their customer journeys, whether that's click and collect that they've had to establish because they can't open their store, whether it's paying at a, paying at table using a QR code, a request for a payment, a refund and so on. So many of these journeys are enriched and enhanced and improved by real-time payments. So I actually think, like Teresa, we will see increasing adoption as real-time goes up the corporate agenda um, and is going to be important to, to how businesses survive and thrive in the future. Amazing. Now, Gavin, if I could stay with you then. Um, I, I always like in these discussions to bring out some tangible benefits and Teresa's already mentioned a couple, but I want to start actually uh, you know, nailing them to the, the kind of possible so we can actually uh, work towards them. What are some of the benefits that, that corporates could see beyond just having that faster payments? Yeah, so I mean, I think the availability and, and having it is, is, is just the starting point. But actually, how you how businesses embed instant and real-time payments into customer journeys is really the thing that's going to drive the adoption, uh, improve satisfaction, and, and ultimately benefit their competitive position. Um, so, you know, whether that's a journey to pay staff instantly, so, you know, we've got more people now uh, working in the so-called gig economy. Um, we've got solutions emerging for staff who want to access some of their pay before payday, actually at Lloyd's, we've created some APIs that allow the business to generate those the instant payments that are needed to support those journeys. So yes, we've got the access, but enabling businesses to access it instantly via an API is what we believe will lead to adoption. Similarly, you know, reaching UK accounts by faster payments from overseas We've developed a solution that allows that. That's another way of getting more traffic into the, the instant payments scheme or allowing people to make open banking payments to pay for things, you know, to donate to charity, to top up their savings account, um, to buy goods online. And again, you know, we've developed APIs for that. So very much our focus at the moment is beyond the mere availability of, of, of the instant payments and it's really focused on opening up the channels and opening up the access and making it easy for our businesses to embed these services in their own customer journeys. That's what's going to make them successful. That's going to, going to lead to more widespread adoption of instant payments. That sounds absolutely brilliant hearing that, how it's going to really benefit the customer um, and as a result, that's what's going to drive the, the kind of the force de majeure behind it. So, Teresa, could I ask, why have the barriers to entry been so high for maybe some of the smaller challenger banks that, that are currently not on the, the fast payments model? I think with that, we, we need to, to sort of to flip back and to think about when the scheme was, was designed and delivered, which was over 10 years ago now. 
and the payments landscape was a very very different place it was really it was kind of it was dominated by large banks there were a lot fewer fintechs and and arguably um i would say that you know it was written with sort of a large bank in mind and they've already overcome some of those barriers you know they're already in that place whereas for fintechs and others possibly it's it's somewhere near here so i think there's that i think another barrier early doors was just a a waiting game what will this be like then? What will the number of transactions and volumes look like? You know, let's wait and see. Let's wait and see if it works. So I think there was a lot of that early doors as well. From a technology point of view as well, there, there are many challenges and, and just, just three of them are, it's a rigorous rule set and rightly so for security purposes to apply for faster payments, but also to implement it. So, you know, you, you have to be of a certain standard and I, I don't shy away from saying that because, you know, especially when you design something early doors, you probably want it to, to start over here at being super, super robust, so that then over time you can learn and you can adjust as you go along. Um, the second sort of technology piece is a company has to decide, am I gonna do this myself? When I go to an aggregator? Am I gonna embed in a third party? And whatever decision you arrive at, have you got the skills and the technical resource, not just to implement the thing, but to keep it going as well? So that, that, that's a big decision to make and, you know, and that's a challenge. And then, then there's a practical one as well. Thirdly, the practical one is you're given, you're given that weekend to implement faster payments from a technology point of view. My goodness me, you need to be ready. You need to, make, you need to cross your fingers and your toes and make sure that nothing's going to come down the track internally that's going to sort of knock that out because it's, it's fairly, it's, it's rigid for good reasons, but it doesn't give you a lot of flex. Um, in addition, there, there are the other barriers, other technical ones, you know, suddenly you've got to go from a nine to five support model to a 24 seven. And then we've already talked as well about it, you know, fast payments to me is a bit like a piece of Lego. You've got this piece of Lego as a base and you can build whatever you want on it. Well, do you know what? Building the base is one thing and then building the other bits and pieces on top is something new and different. That takes extra time and money and skill and resource. So there, there's, there's a, there are barriers, they can be overcome, particularly with help, they can be overcome. But you know, today that we, we still got more than 400 banks who aren't connected to the faster payment schemes and 2000 e money institutions. So we need, we need to think, you know, how, how do we get everybody on board? Because that makes the whole landscape better and makes society better and gives us all access to much more improved products and services. Definitely. Now, with approximately 46 real-time payment schemes around the world, I think actually, Teresa, you said uh, there might be around 50 now, um, and many more obviously on the way. How important um, are new standards going to be like ISO 20022? So I, ISO is going to be incredibly important. ISO will harmon, harmonise the data that is carried with the payment. They will both go in the same direction, which, which, which first of all in itself is, is super. Also, there will be a common interpretation of the data as well. And that will allow for real deep analytics. That's, that's really important. So the data piece in ISO is, really holds a lot of promise to open it's sort of a data-led analysis, insights, new propositions, tailoring of services, immediate services and long-term and short-term services. So that's going to work really well. However, everybody, every player has to play. If you've got this whole value chain and say somebody along here truncates a little bit of information, then it becomes less valuable along the chain to the providers and to the end customers. So you know, everybody has to play and to do it well. There are different scheme deadlines for ISO enablement and there's a cluster of them around 2025. So providers are working at the moment and bottom line are working with many hundreds of, of, um, of providers say okay then are you going to be an iso native you know are you going to be ready and there right now or are you going to sort of you know do, do sort of a double hatting coexistence type thing until this cluster of deadlines in 2025 and something i can share with with all of the, the sort of providers we've been working with is please start early because you know the, there is a huge underestimation as to the complexity involved and the and the depth and the, the breadth and the depth of the reach within the organisation and everything that needs to change. 
Uh, and then finally, I would say, don't treat ISO as a compliance point, you know, as a compliance project. It has huge benefits. So the, the data that carried, particularly for AML sanctions and screenings, will be powerful. So that it's not just a compliance pro project, it has real benefit and opportunity. Interesting. Now, uh, Gavin, as a, as a self-proclaimed uh, kind of payments geek, I'd love to hear your perspective on, on what some what you think some of the benefits are from ISO 2022. Yeah, so, I mean, I think when it comes to standards, we, we, we love standards and we love formats as, as payment geeks, um, but they are critical um, to the to the harmonization of payment schemes across the world. And I'm optimistic, actually, because um, I don't think ISO migration is being done in isolation just for instant payments. Um, you know, if we look at the, um, the RTGS replacement in the UK, if we look at what's happening in Europe, um, if we look forward to the new payments architecture in the UK, they all look like they're going to adopt ISO 2022. So investing the, the effort and tackling the challenge is not just going to benefit you for participation in instant payments. Actually, it's an important skill set to have to participate in, in payments um, right across the spectrum. So for that reason, I'm optimistic. Um, as, as to some of the added value benefits, um, I think being able to carry um, more data with a payment when we've been so used to sending 118 bytes of data for the last 40 years is going to be revolutionary and, and transformational in the payments world. So the ability to, to send additional information like invoice information, tax information, um, order information in a payment message, I think opens up a, a, a world of opportunity. And, and I always look at these things through through the eyes of the customer. So yes, as a banker, um, I think it's great that we will be able to use better data to catch the bad guys and the bad actors in our fraud and financial crime processes. But actually, I, I think there are real applications in the, in the client world for them to, to digitize and transform more of their journeys. Um, and that will ultimately lead to, 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 to better propositions and more success for them. That's absolutely exciting. And hearing that fraud angle um, as a consumer, just it just sounds absolutely amazing just how revolutionary this international standard is gonna be. Now, speaking of obviously the, the international aspect of it, um, Teresa, if I could come to you with this. Uh, one thing that really excites me is you know, obviously we're seeing 50 or so different real-time um, payment schemes around the world, but do you think you know standards like ISO 20022 um, are going to in, like bring together the real-time cross-border payments uh, landscape together far quicker than maybe it would have done before? The million-dollar question. Mm -hmm. um, it will. It will certainly help. Um, I think of these things a little bit like language because you would say, well, you know, these schemes, they'll pretty much do the same thing at a core level, overlay different, but at a core level. So surely it'd be quite easy to connect them. But in my mind, it's, it's a little bit like English. There's UK English and then there's US English. And then if you look across the UK, there's loads of different accents as well. You know, it, it's not common, it's not standard. So to work directly, it is difficult. So then I come to the point, I go, OK, then, so how can we achieve interoperability across screens? Is it is that a clustering type thing? So if you look at the Nordics and P27, if you get that group there and you say, OK, then if they if they can combine, could the ACHs in in the Americas in America combine and could they talk to each other kind of network to network? Would, would that be an enabler as well, as well as ISO and standards and the like? Um, and then, of course, you've got universal aggregators as well. Is, is there something that can go in and look across all of these schemes and go, oh, yeah, OK, then we're, we're, yeah, I'll bring that down to a common language and it'll all interoperate. So and that takes a lot of work. Bottom line, have a universal aggregator. And what it takes to do that and to bring customers to this point is we have to work with SWIFT. We have to work with the national schemes as well. Um, it's exciting, though, because by the end of just this year, 
we will have connected to our T1 and to TIPS and by 2024 to the Swiss system as well. And also we're going to be, you know, we'll be connecting within the US and Canada and the Nordics, Asia and Australia. But, you know, it's not it's not going to happen this time next week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. These things take time. Uh, yeah, the standards, the interpretation and just those different connectivity mod models, because as Gavin said in one of his earlier answers, you know, one size doesn't fit all. One solution isn't the solution necessarily for, for everybody. So I think when it comes to interoperability, I, I think a universal aggregator is a really neat way forward, um, but it's not going to happen next week. No, I can imagine there's so much to untangle there because not just is the payments technology different, but the payments culture, the way that people want to pay is different. Now, I guess, Gavin, could I also get your input on this question? Do you think that we are going to see that universal aggregator when it comes to real-time payments anytime soon? I, I think it will happen, Doug, but like Teresa, I don't think it will be a short-term deliverable. Um, as she mentioned, you know, we've got a, a number of ISO migration events happening around about uh, 2025. So I, I, my the short answer would be sometime after that, um, because it will be easier to do when we've got harmonised standards. You know, if, if you solve the standards problem, then you only have to deal with the other things like currency and time zone and uh, counterparty risk. Um, so we'll deal with that. <laughs> I, I think the reason it will come, though, um, domestic will be the priority. You, you know, the ramping up of volumes domestically um, will happen in the short term. In a recent survey that we did with Lloyds Bank business customers, 35% said they would increase the use of digital payments for sending payments, and 39% said they would increase the use of digital payments for receiving payments in the next 12 months. Now, to me, that means domestically, that's got to be the priority, that's got to be where our focus is. Um, and then I think the cross-border international interoperability will take care of itself when the when the environment's right interesting well guys i think that's all we have time for thank you both for appearing today it's been brilliant hearing your expertise on such a complex and ever-changing industry now so thank you very much and also to all our viewers thank you for watching you can catch the rest of the series and much more over at www.fintechf.com and of course youtube and linkedin where i will see you there in the comment section so thank you very much and goodbye <laughs>